Welcome back to the climate action stage. Have you ever wondered what dolphins can tell us about the ocean? Over the next hour, leading researchers will talk us through their projects that support life on Earth. It's my pleasure to introduce our session host, Dr. Hannah Kubanes. Hannah is a research associate of the British Antarctic Survey. Her own research interests are to develop the use of very high resolution satellite imagery to monitor marine mammals in remote regions and to make this method applicable at a global oceanic scale by improving the efficiency of image analysis through crowdsourcing and automated systems. She's particularly focusing on whales and walrus. Today, she's gonna to talk us through a selection of exciting research. Over to you, Hannah. Thank you. So welcome, everyone. Today, we're gonna to have three great speakers telling us all about how they're using AI to monitor biodiversity. Our first speaker is going to be Penny Clark. She's a marine conservationist and remote sensor, a PhD researcher at the British Antarctic Survey and the University of Edinburgh. And she studies cetacean mass strandings and ocean health uh, from space. Then our second speaker will be Nick Wright. Nick is an engineering professor at Newcastle University where he undertakes research in the use of digital technology applied to unusual environments. And our last speaker, Luisa Orsini, is an associate professor in biosystems and environmental change at the University of Birmingham. She's also a Turing Fellow and has a long term goal of improving human health and well being by creating a novel evidence based framework that enables the identification of actionable targets for ecosystem services conservation. So each of them are going to present their talk and um, first we'll have Penny and after her talk we'll welcome questions from the audience uh, via Slido. So if you want to, if you have any questions popping up through your mind while uh, Penny is speaking, just uh, put them on Slido. And Penny Clark, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Hannah. Can you see my screen? Perfect, I think you can see my screen. Well, hi everyone, and I'm so delighted to be here with you today. Um, hopefully over the next 10 to 15 minutes, I'm gonna make you fall in love with whales just as much as I love them and take you on an out of this world adventure to look at cetacean strandings from space and to see just how AI could help us. So let's start from the beginning. Why do we even want to study whales? So beyond the fact that they're these beautiful charismatic megafauna, they provide vital ecosystem services to our oceans. Um, so I'm going to ask you to take a breath. Now I'm going to ask you to take another breath. And now I'm going to ask you to say thank you to the whales and our oceans. And that's because whales are ecosystem engineers. So what do we mean by that? So their poo fertilizes the ocean, which stimulates phytoplankton growth. And phytoplankton photosynthesizes and produces oxygen. And it's also the base of all marine food webs. Their enormous bodies also throughout their lifetime are sequestering carbon. So when they die, if they don't strand, they fall to the bottom of the ocean and effectively form a carbon sink. But sadly, there are a lot of anthropogenic threats that are threatening the whales in our oceans today from ocean noise, ship strikes, bycatch and entanglement from fishing gear, ocean pollution in industrial and populated coastlines and wildlife tourism, such as whale watching. So we need to understand the extent to which these threats are impacting whales. However, the lifestyle of a whale, if they're highly mobile, they inhabit relatively inaccessible locations, which means they're really challenging to study. And so you may have heard of the story of the canary in the coal mine. Well, just like the canary, the cetaceans, the whales, they are the sentinels of our oceans. So when a cetacean strands, and it washes up on shore, it almost acts as an early warning system that something is amiss in our oceans, that maybe ocean health isn't so great. So they're a huge and valuable source of information. But how do we study them at the moment? Well, currently they're studied by stranding networks, and you can see on this map they're indicated by a red cross. Now, stranding networks are networks of trained personnel on the ground along the coastlines. And you can see that these are largely biased towards populated coastlines. And 
They also correspond to higher GDP countries. But what you can see there's large areas of coastlines that are actually absent of monitoring. And these areas are remote coastlines like the polar regions, maybe complex coastlines like the Chilean Patagonia. And there's also geopolitical uh, unrest that causes coastlines to become remote, such as in the Middle East. And so it's these areas that we need to increase our monitoring. And this is where satellites come in. So we're talking about very high resolution satellites that are up in space. And you're probably thinking, you know, how can we see a whale all the way from space? Well, satellite images are made up of lots of pixels, so tiny squares of information. And I'm just putting my cursor onto the screen so you can see a little bit like this diagram at the bottom, these squares are the equivalent of a pixel in an image. And these pixels, individual, can see the equivalent of 30 centimeters of detail on the ground. And when we think some whales are as large as 18 meters, that's a lot of detail that we can see. So it helps us see whales from space. Now, where does AI come into this? So I'm taking you back out to this worldview so you can visualize this again. I'm just gonna remind you like the extent of the coastlines that we're trying to cover, these remote coastlines are huge, especially if we look at the size of UK where we're sat right now. We are covering a huge area or we're needing to cover a huge area of monitoring to see strandings in these locations. And if we were to do that by somebody manually going through these images, well, we would not only need hundreds of hours in a day, but our eyes would probably also pop out of our head from staring at the screen for so long. And so we need automated detection to help us build long-term systematic monitoring programs along the world's remote coastlines. So we really do need to automate everything. So what's been done before? I think this is a good place to start. So I'm gonna take you on an adventure to the Chilean Patagonia. And this was the area of the world's largest known mass stranding of baleen whales in the world in 2015, where 343 whales washed ashore and they remained undetected for two months because the area is so remote. And I'm going to talk to you about Fretworth Hall's study. So this is Peter and his colleagues' study. And so back in 2019, they released a paper which happened to be the first successful count of stranded cetaceans in satellite imagery, but it was also the first and only attempt of using automated detection on stranded whales in satellite imagery. And he used a spectral angle mapper. So this basically means he identified spectral, like pure pixels of stranded cetaceans in satellite imagery. He then fed those signals into a spectral angle mapper and asked it to search through a new image and find features with a similar spectral profile over a user-defined threshold. And I'm going to show you now with my cursor, he tried this on two separate images. So this first set of three um, graphs and images correspond to image one, and then the second set corresponds to image two. And what you can see in image one is the whales are largely on the water's edge. And in this particular attempt using spectral angle mapper, there was a 66% accuracy of detecting stranded cetaceans that were also detected manually. And this is probably because of this very well um, fine difference in spectral profile with their environment. If we come down to this second image, especially if we look at this particular individual, there was actually only a 22% success rate in identifying those features as whales that were also identified in the manual detection. And again, this could be due to this sort of similar spectral profile to its environment. And this is what we call confounding features. So there was a lot of errors of commission in which features that weren't whale were identified as whale. So in this case, sandy beaches. And this was because these whales were largely higher up the shoreline away from the water's edge. But what we can see is these images were viewed, the spectral profiles were viewed in true color imagery. So that's what we see visible with our eye. But to also had a look at these images in the near infrared band. And what you can see is that the vegetation appears a red color and the cetaceans almost appear this cream colored hue. And so maybe this is something that we could explore in the future because generally the conclusion of this paper in the true color image was that spectral profiles weren't that successful at automating detection. And this is due to the heterogeneous decomposition rates of what strandings can look like as they are decomposing. So what else is being done? Well, convolutional neural networks have been really successfully applied to wildlife from space studies, so to elephants from space, to albatross from space, and to seals from space, which from this image, you can kind of see it could kind of look like a mass stranding of whales on a beach 
all the way from space. So could be promising. But I'm going to focus on Alex's study with his colleagues where he looked at live whales. So he was using a ResNet and a DenseNet uh, model, and he was taking very high resolution aerial imagery, so that's two centimeters imagery. He downscaled that to the equivalent of a satellite, so that's 30 centimeters imagery, uh, 30 centimeters resolution. And then he tiled the imagery into tiny little tiles, and he was using the aerial imagery as the training set and the satellite imagery as the test set. And what he was asking the convolutional neural network to do was to identify those tiles that contained water and those tiles that contained whales. And they used a tenfold validation. And each through each iteration, they used the errors of commission and emission to put back into the model. And they were using an image, image net data set and then using their data in the last layer, they would run the model. And what they found was at the end of this, the like one of their models actually found 100% of the live whales. So this potentially convolutional neural networks could be a really promising way to move forward with our particular question of cetacean strandings from space. And what Alex, his conclusion actually came to was that maybe semi-automated approaches are going to be the way forward in which, for example, in this case, the computer can remove or tell us all the water tiles so we don't spend time looking through those, so it can speed up the process for us. But I just wanted to show you this video because I mentioned that Peter said the heterogeneity in decomposition was a challenge for spectral profiles, but I think it's probably going to be a challenge across our like automated system or automated detection that we try to achieve. Because as a whale washes up on shore, from the minute it washes up, they're constantly decomposing, their shape changes, their size changes, their spectral profile changes, their flippers, their flukes, their appendages break off. And especially in tidal regions, their parts of their bodies all get washed up around the shore, up and down, and they're moving places. So this is gonna be a huge challenge. So what's the next steps? So we have very few data points at this stage. And obviously for AI, we're gonna to need to increase that. So we want to try and analyze annotate as many, many whales, stranded whales of all levels of decomposition as possible. And we also want to annotate as many of the confounding features as we can. So this nice example here was actually a storm impacted coastline from space. And you can see all of these wood uh, trees that have blown over could kind of look like a cetacean stranding from space. So we need to include examples like this. We also want to augment the data, so maybe we want to flip it, rotate it, increase our data set artificially, and we could maybe use simulated data, so we take the shape of a whale and put it in different environments. And another way in which we can increase our data set, similar to how Alex had used drone imagery or aerial imagery, so we could take those from stranded networks to increase our data sets. Just like Alex said, I think the way forward at this stage with the level of AI and the resolution of satellite imagery, semi-automated approaches are probably going to be the way forward at this stage where we ask the automated system to find these whales, stranded whales for us. And then we, the ex experts go in and play a game of where's whaley. And I mean, who doesn't get excited by whales? So that's not a bad thing that we get a chance to have a look through these imagery ourselves. This conference is not just about AI, it's about data science as a whole. And there's another thing that we can do or potentially look at, which is looking at the other environmental data in other remotely sensed data. So ocean color, sea surface temperature, and seeing if we can understand the environmental conditions that are prevailing before or during or after these stranding events to see if we can build predictors. And then we can model this in the future to predict where they might occur. But on that note, I would really like to encourage you to go and read our recent paper. So if you are interested in this work and you do think it's something that you would like to go away and learn more about, then we did have a paper out just towards the end of last year that basically forms a roadmap for what I've talked about today and where we want to go with this in the future. And this forms part of my PhD. So just to summarize, in terms of like studying cetacean strandings from space, satellites and AI are going to be hugely valuable in remote regions. Regions, particularly if we look at somewhere like the polar regions where we want to gather baseline data and satellites can help us do that to gather a baseline now so when climate change or other changes do occur we can evaluate the impact that it's had on whales but it's also going to be hugely valuable particularly in these remote regions to be able to say 
build patterns, to know when these events are, to send people to the right place at the right time, to invest resources most efficiently. And so this is why satellites and AI are going to be hugely helpful for cetacean strandings from space and to save the whales again. So I wanted to say on that note, a huge thank you for listening and I would love to have any questions. Thank you, Benny. That was, yeah, really interesting talk. Always lovely to hear about whales and really engaging. So now we're going to take questions on Slido. But as there aren't any coming up yet, um, I'll, I, have, I have a question for you, Penny. Uh, so you said you're planning, so you're, you're going to be using very high um, resolution satellite imagery, which I am also using. Um, and you're going to use them to build a training data set to like test out the various AI um, methods. But this, you're going, yeah, it's good. You're going to need a lot of satellite images to be able to get a lot of annotations. So could you tell us a bit like about how accessible or very high resolution satellite imagery to like, um, I guess anyone in the world and in particular um, people surveying those uh, remote coastlines? Yeah, good question. Uh, thank you, Hannah. Um, so we're looking, as I say, at very high resolution data, which is a, well, they are commercially owned, the satellites. And so this image is very, very costly. And there's two types of data that we're dealing with here. So there's archive data, um, so this is data that's been taken and is in an archive that you can access. And there's also what we call task data. So this is where you can go to a satellite company and say, I would like a picture at this time in this location. And so the costs between those differ. Um, so obviously task imagery to ask for a certain location at a certain time is more costly. Um, but there's accessibility in terms of the archive data is an interesting one because especially in this case where we're looking at strandings, that's an event in space and time, whether those even exist in an archive is one question. And if it does exist, is it covered in cloud? I, I mean, the chances are, you, of you finding these are limited, but when you do, yes, then there is a cost, cost aspect to think about here. I and mean, then in terms of the test imagery, um, there's also an aspect to think about, which is prioritization or access prioritization. So satellite companies, will prioritize um, like commercial customers, especially regular customers, maybe military or government. And um, so to actually task a, a satellite at the time you want to task it, uh, you are in that like run of prioritization. And so in terms of prioritization and cost, what we really need to do, especially if we want to make this something that can be used and applicable across the world is to build partnerships with uh, satellite companies and to have them support scientific research. And in particular, in the, just the case of my example, I mentioned that we want to build these uh, like long-term stranding monitoring programs across the world's coastlines, which means we want to make people locally sustaining to be able to do this. Um, so I mentioned that a lot of the coastlines that are absent of monitoring by the remote coastlines that are in lower GDP countries. So, if, you know, how are they going to afford to purchase this imagery. And I think one thing that's important to mention here is that we have the term colonial science. So it's very easy that I could potentially sit here from my office right now and purchase an image that's from a coastline elsewhere around the world and study that without investing um, or sharing my knowledge with the local population in that area. And so I think to sort of not have that and to build locally sustaining stranded networks, especially in this case, then we do really need to just build partnerships with satellite companies and have that support for science. Thank you, Benny. Um, and I guess, yeah, we have time for one more question. Um, how, how do you deal with coasts that are wooded areas and therefore not clearly visible from space? So in terms of like the, the coastline might cover the coast you mean I like believe, a, a yeah, forest that, might overshadow i believe that uh, yeah, the whales might be below the trees or <laughs> yeah. the, these are the challenges i mean it's similar to the clouds like if it's cloudy you unfortunately you just can't see the event um if it is a wooded area there's like different things that can cause problems here is when the satellite takes the picture if the sun's at the wrong angle and it sh causes shadows that can also be a challenge so un unfortunately, if the trees are in the way, um, we, we can't really do anything about it. 
Um, but uh, in terms of like the how to differentiate, so I showed in that image there was the confounding feature. Um, no, sorry, there was the spectral angle mapper page that I showed, and there was the near infrared. Well, you could use potentially the near infrared band to differentiate the vegetation that would show up very pink, and then the strandings would show up this sort of cream coloured hue. So you could use that bit to, in terms of if they're blocked by um, the vegetation, unfortunately, then we, yeah, we can't see the whales. Thank you so much, Penny. And so now we're gonna move on to our next speaker, uh, Nick. And Nick Wright is gonna tell us all about using machine learning and AI to monitor dolphin populations. Nick, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Uh my name is Nick Wright from Newcastle University. Um, I'm presenting work actually also on behalf of uh, quite a few colleagues at the university. We have a sort of multidisciplinary group, I guess, studying this at the university with colleagues from marine science, uh, computer science uh, and engineering as well. So what I'm going to talk to you about is actually a very local thing. So it's about um, uh, dolphin populations in the northeast of England, uh, which might be a surprise to some people. People may not be aware that these things actually uh, do live in our waters, actually, but it, it is true. The, the UK actually has quite a few cetacean species, um, some mig mig migratory, some visitors, but also quite a lot of permanent residents. Um, the problem, of course, is that our seas are, uh, as Penny's already remarked about, the sea is, the ocean is not a perfect place anymore. It's very polluted. Uh, particularly in the North Sea, where we are, uh, it's polluted. It's been polluted for many years. It was polluted a lot in the 1950s and 60s with persistent chemicals that were used in uh, all sorts of household product manufacturing at the time, PCBs. And these actually persist in the environment for decades. Um, and they actually do cause quite big problems for our populations. And I'll try and explain a bit about that later. Our oceans are also overfished. The North Sea is very heavily overfished as well, and that also has a big impact. But there's also much more fundamental things. We have lots of boats, um, and uh, we see lots of evidence of vessel strikes, um, uh, which is very sad. But perhaps the biggest uh, threat, actually, that we observe is discarded fishing gear. Um, our seas are full of bits of plastic nets, bits of plastic uh, fishing line, uh, and these actually cause the most largest uh, problem that we observe. But we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we go on. But there is actually a rich um, species uh, of populations that we see in our local waters in the northeast of England. I'm going to talk really about dolphins. So I'm going to concentrate on two particular dolphin species, um, bottlenose dolphins, which are the kind of common dolphin that you might see in a zoo, um, sadly. Um, and another type of dolphin called a white big dolphin, which perhaps people are less familiar with. Uh, and we'll have a look at a bit of those. But we also see whales quite frequently in our waters. We see minke whales, we see humpbacks, occasional sperm whales. We've even sadly had a sperm whale stranding recently, uh, which was also very sad. Um, and we do even see some rarer spe species as well, like orca. So this is all against the backdrop uh, of things like seals uh, and even occasionally visiting walruses, for example. So there's lots going on. Um, but what's really hard is to work out whether these populations are barely surviving whether, or whether they're doing really well. Um, because actually, even just within the few hundred miles of coast that we would monitor in, in the northeast of England, it's still pretty hard to find these creatures. Um, we, we, you know, the sea, it's a big place, even uh, just over such a short distance. So it's actually really tough to find these uh, animals and even tougher to work out how many there are whether they're thriving or whether they're really in trouble. Um, so it's quite tricky. One thing that we have got now, which we didn't have in the past actually, and is a tremendous help in, in, in a number of ways, is actually citizen science. So most areas of the coastline now in the UK, there are Facebook groups which monitor dolphin sightings, where people report dolphin sightings. So if somebody's walking along a beach, they see a dolphin, uh, they'll report it on the Facebook group. And a lot of the, these groups are actually very expert. Um, many of them are actually very dedicated um, sort of uh, to natural science. They, uh, they're very accurate in their reports. Um, but there are other members as well of the groups who are perhaps less accurate as well. So we always have to understand that when we use this citizen science data. But actually, it's a really tremendous resource which has actually helped us. So the first thing that we've done in recent years is we've mined this information uh, with the collaboration of these groups, we, we work with them closely and support them, um, but we use their information and we use their sightings 
to help us find the animals much more quickly and uh, use our resources much more effectively. Now, there are quite well established methodologies actually in biology for, for measuring uh, uh, cetacean populations. They generally involve field work. You go out with boats, you sail a preset route that you might do every year, for example, or very regularly through the year, and you record the number of sightings that you see. So you might see, as here, uh, you see a fin, you know you've seen a dolphin, you record that, and then there are mathematical models which convert that into populations. And these uh, models are, are, are well honed, they've been in, in existence for some years, and have got a lot of uh, justification. But they're very exp this process is very expensive, and what happens traditionally is that people spend the summer months out on boats, for hours and hours and hours with relatively few sightings. And then in the winter, they then have to process all this film uh, to try and build up a catalog of trying to identify how many individuals and make sure they haven't just seen the same individual 20 times on different days, for example. So it's actually a tremendously time consuming uh, job for biologists to, you know, and many of them will spend hundreds and hundreds of hours looking through photo films. Uh, and to try and uh, understand what they have observed in these fieldwork sessions. So we started to work with colleagues in biology to think about what we, how could we apply technology to make this whole process much more efficient, to increase the chances of finding animals when you went out, um, but also to uh, see if we could improve the quality of data that we could generate as well. So this is... Um, some of the work, more recent work, for example, that we've done. So we do photo surveys too. Um, but what we do is that we mine the Facebook data. The Facebook data tells us where the animals are. Practically every day in the summer, there'll be some sighting somewhere. And then we can go directly to that place and actually photograph the animals uh, directly. So instead of spending hundreds of hours wandering around the North Sea, we know exactly where they are, and then we can go and find them, and uh, it's much more efficient. And because of that, we can actually use a, a mixture of camera techniques. So we use above water techniques, but we also use underwater film as well. So this is some film that uh, I, I took a while ago of uh, white big dolphins. These are very curious animals. So we don't, we don't chase the animals. They will come to the boat out of natural curiosity. Uh, and then we'll photograph them as they pass by the boat and as they play with the boat. And what you can see is that many of these animals actually have markings on their bodies. And these are skin complaints, essentially, in the, uh, uh, of the skin of the dolphin that are actually caused or exacerbated by the pollution in the water, for example. So my, the, my colleagues from the School of Biology use this, these skin lesions as a way to measure actually the, the health of the dolphin and also the, the pollution. Uh, that's in the sea. And sadly, you can see that most of these dolphins actually do, do have these kind of markings, indicating, in fact, actually, that they have some kind of skin problems. We can also use these markings and the shape of things like the fins, for example, in these very high resolution pictures to identify the individuals. But even with this technique, where we go out and we go directly to the dolphins, we end up with hundreds of hours of video film, very complicated, dolphins swimming and the other problem is that dolphins don't swim in straight lines. So they swim round the boat repeatedly. They dip in and out of the film. So it's still quite hard to work out the number of individuals. I've watched this film a hundred times and it took me a while to work out how many there are actually in this film. Um, the most you ever see is five, but there are actually nine dolphins in the pod swimming around the boat. So it's quite tricky to work out the individuals just from the film. So, we started then to think about how could we use machine learning and uh, more advanced techniques to actually help us, help the biologists with this tremendously overwhelming task of working out uh, how many individual dolphins that they're seeing. And so we started to use that to generate essentially a more accurate catalog of, of the individuals um, that we see in our things. And we found it necessary to do a number of steps actually to make that work in terms of machine learning. So the first thing we do is we take the thousands and thousands of hours of film that we have and hundreds and hundreds of photos, and we scan them through an automatic system that we built that essentially finds the dolphin amongst all of that film. Because even with the best technique, you still end up with a lot of empty film and then dolphins popping up every now and then in the middle of all of that. 
So the first stage really essentially is to find the, find the fin, find the dolphin. Um, and then we process those images and we extract the shape of the fin, um, which is the primary identifying mark that we might use to do it. Then to begin, we had that problem that you always have in machine learning of needing a labeled data set. So there was a lot of work the first summer uh, setting up this first training set. So we had to get, we had to take the pictures, we had to extract them all, and then we had to label them as individuals uh, to work out, to provide the, the basic data set. Once we trained that though, that trained CNN, the convolutional neural network, then provides a way to identify in the future. And we use a technique use called a Siamese neural network where that enables us to take an, a new image. So, if I, so for example, if I take an image tomorrow of a dolphin, my first question is, have we seen that dolphin before? Is it already in our catalog? <coughs> and the Siamese neural network technique enables us to do that comparison. What it does is it runs the image through the convolutional neural network and it turns it into a, a mathematical embedding, a vector embedding basically of the picture. This is really a, <coughs> excuse me, a, new, uh, a numerical representation of the picture. We can use that vector embedding then to compare to the current catalog and it will then place that individual as being similar to a number of others. So we end up essentially with a short list so the biologist is then faced with having to identify that dolphin against a short list of, say, five candidates, instead of having to look through a catalogue of several hundred. And this greatly reduces the time required to identify individuals and to, to place them in the catalogue, or to say, in fact, this is a new dolphin, the one that we've never seen before. So these neural network techniques are now being very widely used in biology uh, to um, speed up the, the work of processing the imagery, uh, which traditionally has been a huge burden uh, for biologists in this field. We can also use some other image techniques as well, and again, them, some of them very classical. So photogrammetry, measuring things from photographs, was invented in the Victorian period. Um, and actually, it can be used quite successfully also with wildlife. So we use photogrammetry uh, based on, we have calibrated dual lens stereo cameras, and that actually will then record uh, enable us to record essentially a 3D picture of the dolphin um, and we can use that to measure the size of key parameters of the dolphin. For example in this picture we're measuring the separation between the fin and the blowhole and that's a key indicator of the growth of the dolphin. So we can monitor the growth of the dolphins over successive years and again that will tell us something about the ecosystem. Are they finding enough to eat for example? Are they growing properly uh, and, and so on? So it's a very useful technique uh, very simple, uh, very classical actually, but also very helpful in terms of monitoring. The other thing that we do as well is that we monitor acoustically as well. So dolphins use sonar uh, effectively all the time. They use a very high rapid sonar for clicking to find fish, but they also communicate with more whistle based uh, uh, type uh, sonar as well. So we actually have a network of hydrophones that we place up the coast from Newcastle and these sit there more or less the whole summer season, recording thousands of hours uh, of data. And amongst those thousands and thousands of hours, there will be a small percentage of captured acoustic data on the dolphins. So this is very also very valuable for us as well, because it enables us to monitor the movement of the dolphins up and down the coast and also their frequency and their population as well. But this is a classic big data problem where the, uh, you get very sparse data, hours and hours of film with a relatively small amount of useful data, terabytes of data uh, generated practically every week. So traditionally, this used to have to be listened to manually by biologists who would spend the winter just listening and listening and listening, trying to find these uh, dolphin noises. Of course, this is now all applicable now to machine learning. So again, you can, we can train CNNs to recognize the, and find the whistles. And that will then enable the, the, the biologists then to go straight to the whistle and, I, and work out whether that's useful or not for them. Um, we're also now developing a CNN technique to identify individual signature whistles of dolphins. So dolphins, every dolphin has what's called a signature whistle. 
that's their personal call sign, if you like. And if we can identify those, then we will be able to tell uh, how fast they move, where they are, which other dolphins they're in, uh, they're socialising with, for example. So this actually could be a significant uh, development if we can make it to work to you identify these individual dolphin uh, whistles as well. The other thing that we're also extending uh, our activities, in fact, this summer, we're extending now to using autonomous uh, survey craft, uh, hopefully on the both the surface and underwater. So instead of having to go out in boats and find the dolphins, uh, we can actually use the autonomous craft. And what we're also hoping to do is actually to follow the dolphins. So once we find a pod, follow them at a safe distance, uh, and actually we can then record, for example, their conversations with each other, over a few hours as they go, as they feed, as they socialize. They're highly social animals um, and they, they play a lot, uh, they socialize a lot. So we're hoping to use autonomous craft to do this. We can't do it manually, it would just be impossible uh, logistically. But we've developed, a, a, we're developing an AI control system essentially for, for these autonomous boats uh, that will go up and down the coast. And they will actually have to track uh, the dolphins. So, we're developing a system basically for tracking them based on that imagery, the sonar and the sound. Um, and actually the big problem there is the problem actually of the training data set. How do you get enough data to train your system uh, properly to work? Um, and this is, I, I think, a general problem in all of machine learning and AI, the training data required. So I think Penny mentioned the use of simulated data. So we're also doing the same here. We actually generate simulated data in the Unity games engine of uh, dolphin and creatures underwater. And then we train our AI systems on the simulated computer game. Uh, and this then actually gives us then a very a good starting point for refining the training uh, on the real data. So you can use these uh, video game techniques very profitably actually to generate a lot of simulated data as well. So anyway, so that's pretty much given you a good survey, I think of, of the various techniques that we've used over the last few years. Um, it's proved a lot of, uh, it's proved invaluable really in generating all sorts of uh, novel information. And we've started to observe things in, in the dolphin community that we just didn't see before as a consequence. So this is some film of uh, just dolphins coming and playing at the front of the boat, bottle those dolphins. And if you look carefully there, you can see that there's a disabled dolphin amongst the pod. And that disabled dolphin actually is looked after by all the other dolphins. That's a healthy one. The disabled one is about to appear, I think, quite soon there. It swims funny. It doesn't swim with its, with its uh, fin vertical because it actually has a deformed spine and it's actually looked after by the other dolphins quite uh, protectively. They find food for it and they protect it. Um, and it's a really nice example, actually, of the social behavior animals that are being very much more complex than we would otherwise have known. And it's only through actually the fact that we can, we can observe their lives much more closely by using these techniques that we've begun to be aware of some of these much more advanced social uh, things amongst the dolphins. Anyway, so I hope I've given you a good overview uh, of the different things. Um, and I'm gonna stop there uh, and go back to uh, the auditorium. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Nick. That was very fascinating. Uh, so we're, we're going to have time for one quick question. Um, is, there, uh, is there a benefit in exploring CNNs to determine dolphin health from calls? Do dolphins adjust how they communicate when they are sick in the same way we do? Um, yeah, this, the dolphins communicate all the time. Um, and it's clear that a lot of it's just routine, that they're, they're just, you know, they, they don't seem to need to hunt all the time. They seem to find food fairly easily. Um, you know, they don't, they probably don't spend that much longer eating during a 24 hour period than we do, as far as we can see. They find food fairly easily. Um, and then they socialize um, and they play a lot, for example, even, um, and then, it's quite clear also that you see, um, you know, distress. If, if, if they are distressed, for example, they will communicate that um, quite, you know, quite quickly to each other. 
and they will protect each other from, you know, if a boat comes too near them and they get spooked, they will, uh, you know, they will transmit that quite quickly to the others. And if a dolphin is in difficulty, they will do that as well, or if dolphin is, is ill in some way. So they do have quite complex um, communications, which we can definitely see that in, the, in our experience with them. But the question is whether, sorry, the question is whether you can use the CNN to do that. I think, I think the answer is probably yes, you probably can. Thank you, Nick. And now we're going to move to Louisa Olsini. She's going to tell us all about the biodiversity time machine. Louisa, the floor is yours. My name is Louisa Orsini, and today I would like to share with you my passion for biodiversity, uh, not only uh, from the iconic species that you have seen in the previous presentations, but also from things that we cannot see. Um, and if you have questions, please pop them in the chat. And if you want to continue the conversation, feel free to connect with me uh, later on uh, through my um, uh, Twitter handle. So let's start with um, what really uh, I consider biodiversity. It comes in all forms, shapes and colors from very small to very large, and uh, it has an intrinsic value. But it has also an indirect value because biodiversity delivers a number of ecosystem services. Uh, for example, clean water, food, pollination, uh, climate regulation or also cultural services. So a day spent by a lake is a service that nature provides and is underpinned by biodiversity. So it's not a surprise that um, pollution, climate change and other kinds of threats that are reducing biodiversity are also affecting ecosystem health and resilience. And lack of or reduced ecosystem health imposes uh, reduced uh, ecosystem services, and this has a direct impact on our social economic well-being. Unfortunately, uh, biodiversity is declining at an uh, alarming rate. Uh, millions and millions of species are, uh, exp uh, are uh, being um, affected every year. We are losing many of them, and this means that if we don't act immediately and effectively, future generations by not be able to enjoy the services that nature provides. And this is making our planet sick. But because we are, we eat, we breed biodiversity, this is also making us ill. There is more than 9 million people every year dying because of pollution or suffering because they cannot enjoy ecosystem services. This is a staggering number if you think that is only surpassed by COVID-19. This is a sad story, but I'm not here to tell you a sad story. I'm here to tell you how we can make it better. And so if biodiversity is still declining, regardless of our um, effort, that means we are not doing something well. And so let's start with looking at what are the challenges we have to address. Probably the first big challenge is that biodiversity loss happens over space and time and economic scales. And um, it's not something that we realize overnight. Uh, so for us to understand what environmental factors are leading to loss of biodiversity, we should reconstruct a continuous um, and long-term um, record of changes that occur. The second point I want to make is that the perception of loss, what I call here shifted baseline. So let me explain it with an example. If you were born at the beginning of the 1900 and you were compare loss of biodiversity in coral reefs now and in the past, you'll be actually shocked how much has been lost. But if you were born mid-century, probably your perception of loss would be less dramatic. However, for us to understand what caused the current patterns of biodiversity loss, we have to start from the beginning. So we have to go back all the time until we hit a pristine baseline that started all the process. Another issue that we are all facing is that we tend to look at biodiversity and causes of biodiversity loss on a one species level versus one environmental factor at a time. This is because it's more manageable and it's more um, approachable. 
but in reality, we should embrace complexity, look at all the parameters and patterns that might affect biodiversity change. And so different threats like climate change, pollution, habitat fragmentation, they should all be considered in order for us to understand what is the cause of biodiversity loss. Because only by understanding the cause, we can intervene, we can in, uh, um, act uh, in an appropriate way. And finally, although we want to conserve every species on Earth, let's face it, that's not possible. So we need to find a way to compromise, to prioritize, unless we want completely to stop production and we want to, um, you know, revert to probably a lifestyle of 50 years ago. So these are a number of challenges, and these might explain why, even if we are trying hard, we are not really making great progress. So what can we do? What I'm going to show you is a proposed framework that came out of the work of a really truly multidisciplinary group of people, um, including myself. Um, and there is biologists, ecologists, chemists, um, computer scientists, even economists in this. And how do we actually respond to the challenge of climate change with all the points that I made so far? We use sedimentary archives from freshwater ecosystems. Why? Because these sedimentary archives um, um, provide um, a continuous record of biological and abiotic changes through time, and they can go as far back as you want until a pristine baseline predating major human impact. And uh, these sedimentary archives can be dated. So you know exactly the age of each layer of sediment. And from each one, you can reconstruct the biological community, the um, abiotic factors that affected the communities at certain times in the past. We also have quite a lot of wealthy data from weather stations that we can align with this history. And then what we end up, as you can see, is um, a huge amount of data. So how do we make sense of this? That's where AI come into place. And so we start from a data-driven approach. We are not um, starting from an hypothesis or a single species or a single chemical. We are actually asking this sediment, what was there at certain time in the past? And we are reconstructing the entire time series. And then we are asking AI, using um, uh, sparse canonical correlation analysis and network analysis, what are the co-varying factors within each of these matrices and what are the co-varying factors between them so that we are able to identify what factors might lead to biodiversity change. So what this does is generating a hypothesis we can test in experimental setups and against long-term data. And our long-term plan is to use training data from multiple of these uh, sedimentary archives to forecast the future of biodiversity and ecosystem services. So this framework has now been applied to at least a case study that I want to share with you, at least for big lines. So you see how we do this in practice. We are here studying a lake that um, has a very well-known um, history of human impact, going from a pristine uh, condition through eutrophication, through land use, and then partial, partial recovery. We have sampled these core, and from each layer of this sediment, we have done biological fingerprinting. How do we do this? Is by applying metabarcoding to environmental DNA. So metal barcoding has a barcoding in a, a supermarket is essentially a piece of DNA that allows you to recognize certain taxonomic groups. And environmental DNA is all the GOS DNA left behind by communities at certain times in the past. So by doing this, you are able to fingerprint and by entire biological community across hundreds of years. And we do the same by uh, doing chemical fingerprinting using mass spectrometry. When you have also climate data, we apply machine learning. And what we extract from this is a subset of environmental factors that affect certain taxonomic groups. This is something that regulators can work on. So let me show you how this data look like. 
I'm showing you here an example only for one of the meta barcodes that looks at bacterial communities. So what you have here on the X axis is the time that we uh, collect from the sediment core. And here is the species numbers through time. So as you can see here, the question we ask is, is the number of total species throughout the 100 years changed for bacteria? The answer is not really. But when we go and look at community composition through time, which here is represented in the heat map by beta diversity, in which we compare the different lake phases, which are four here, and blue means more similar, red more dissimilar. You can see by naked eye that there are four main groups and these communities correspond largely to the four lake phases. So we can say that whereas the total number of species have not changed, the community composition has changed in correspondence of the transition from different lake phases. And then by doing taxonomic assignment, we can actually identify what the taxonomic groups are actually changing between the lake phases. Why is this relevant? Because this allows us to do a quantification of functionality. So what I'm representing here is a comparative analysis of uh, different lake phases. And what we are asking here is to identify functional pathways that changed between lake phases. And all these dots are different functions and functional pathways. And what you can see is that um, functions like metabolism or uh, um, um, uh, degradation or uh, uh, infection disease response change with the lake phases. So this means that when the community composition changes, this has an impact on the functionality of the ecosystem. Now, the next question is to ask, okay, who is responsible for this? Because that's the only way we can actually intervene. And obviously, as mentioned before, there are many factors that could influence this, but the machine learning here is helping us identifying taxa that are both affected in this case by chemical pollutions and climate variables. And so uh, go, going from a complete um, unbiased approach to identifying few things that actually are changing and are strongly correlated with each other. So our end point of this exercise is this. So what I'm representing here is again, the four lake phases that encompass hundreds of years. And what we have represented here is one example of this application in which we identify the colorful lines as herbicides and this blue line has the taxonomic, taxonomic group that suffered mostly from herbicide pollution. You can see that the peak of uh, herbicide introduction in the lake corresponds to the most severe decline in green algae. Now you cannot see really green algae with naked eye, but they are extremely important in delivering um, water quality in um, climate regulation, and they are often used as an indicator species for water quality. So what you're looking at here is we started from a large and huge number of data, but what we are going to regulators is a list of 10 top chemicals that are actually having an adverse effect on um, taxonomic groups that support important ecosystem functions. And whereas regulators are not able to intervene when you tell them, every possible chemical is the culprit, they can do something when you go to them with number 10 or 12 of this. So this is more feasible for them to manage interventions and to manage conservation. And in fact, we are working with the Environment Agency of England that is very much interested in moving away from single species survey that honestly do not work and don't do the job towards system level approaches. And we are doing this by applying the tools to their own biomonitoring program to see how we can adapt the tools that they, can, they should be able to apply them regularly 
uh, every year in their biomonitoring projects. So just to conclude, when life science made AI, we have a much more informative way of looking at ecosystems, where we look at system level approaches rather than indicator species that might not really represent the pulse of the ecosystem. The system level approach allows us to have a focus on functionality and so to protect the taxonomic groups that deliver functions and services. And our approach enables us to prioritize uh, conservation and intervention um, to regulate certain environmental factors. These allows basically or accelerates ecological restoration. So if we allow the ecosystem to recover itself, we are better off than the ecosystem um, delivers ecosystem services and essentially gives us a huge um, service. So it is important, my message here is biodiversity in whatever format you're looking at it, it's all important, but also the small things that you cannot see are extremely important. And if you want to continue this conversation, I'll be very happy to hear from you. For now, thanks very much for listening. Thank you, Louisa. That was a really fascinating talk. Um, so we're gonna have time for one question. So I was wondering, so you've showed us example of using this in freshwater ecosystems. And looking back to our two other talks, uh, are you planning to use this for marine ecosystems? Um, that's, thanks for the question. That's one of the plans we have is to expand this kind of approach, at least to marine environments. Uh, we know already we can apply that to rivers, but environmental DNA is a bit unstable in river because everything moves. But when you look at marine sediments, we have the same kind of approach and I'm quite confident we will have a success in applying this approach. Excellent. So the session is coming to an end. I'd like to thank our, our audience and our speakers and have a good rest of the day. Thank you.